I want to begin by thanking all of them for inviting me here. This is my first time to, uh, to the, do I call it AI Square or AI2? AI2. AI2, okay. Uh, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's a beautiful space and a uh, very stimulating environment. I've been to Seattle a couple of times. I think my first intern happened in Seattle at Microsoft, like, uh, like 12 or maybe 14 years ago. But it's very nice to come back. And uh, I'm going to talk about something kind of strange you know, in, uh, in machine learning. You know. I don't know how, much, how many of you are uh, working on uh, like, uh, the mainstream like algorithm models for machine learning, and how many are actually doing the heavy duty, you know, maybe uh, you know, uh, almost like 30 implementations of machine learning algorithms on big systems. Right. So this is about the latter part. I'm trying to argue that uh, this is also part of machine learning instead of uh, the work we want to ship to the programmers or the system folks to, to focus on. Because uh, in my past few years of working with scalable machine learning, I find a lot of uh, interesting problems which can be better solved if machine learning people want to take a deep kind of uh, dive into it and uh, study the mechanisms you know, uh, inside those implementations or the design. So I'm going to share with you some of the experiences I had you know, during this journey. So it's about, okay, I need to have a really fancy title uh, to, to catch people's eyes, so I call it how to make things really big in AI. But the, what I'm really talking about is the strategies and the principles for distributed machine learning. All right, so machine learning, you know, from the outsiders is like this, right? People want to build this a magic box where you can dump in data and then, you know, you get, as a result, predictions, hypotheses, and things like that out of it. Uh, but this rosy view never happens inside machine learning community because uh, what we see is actually more like this. Right? We are given some tasks in a variety of spaces, like uh, you know, natural language processing, computer vision, biology, security, social network, and so on. And then what we are very good at is to design all these uh, fancy models. You can see fancy names here already, you know, deep learning, um, maximum margin models, non-parametric Bayesian models, and all that. I myself spend a lot of time actually developing some of these models over the past decade. Uh, but then there is a gap between our model and uh, the machine we actually use to implement them. And these are the kind of hardware and infrastructures we usually run into. It could be a single machine like this, or it could be a cluster of machines. Nowadays, people talk about cluster of GPUs and the hybrid systems and all that. And then to make this happen on top of that, you need to either by yourself or hire someone to do this part, which is this a very, very uh, hairy uh, you know, coding, you know, you know, uh, do, uh, you know, activity, which is, you know, sometimes can be very challenging. And especially in the presence of uh, massive data, you know, we're talking about not data that are really big, like petabytes of data, uh, of a complex formality and the modality, then, you know, you need to bring in complex models, like the models you see here. You know, a commonality of all these models is that they all have a lot of parameters. They are so big that they often run out of the uh, memory of a single machine. They can be a billion parameters or even a trillion parameters. Uh, of course, I'm not trying to come here to argue, you know, we need, you know, such big model everywhere. I mean, someone argued for me already in their business, uh, in their application. So I'm going to assume that someone will need this model to happen. And then our goal is to uh, answer how to make it happen correctly. One of the way we want to make it happen is to see a curve like this, right? As we add more and more machines, we're going to see this a linear increase of our power to catch up you know, the need you know, for large model and large data. Uh, but uh, you know, this is, of course, the ideal linear curve. Maybe you want to get somewhere close to here. But uh, for any people who work in industry or even in a university modest size cluster, we usually see this red curve, which is that when we add a few machines to begin with, we get uh, you know, a reasonable curve, like four machines maybe, or maybe eight machines. We see you know, maybe a four time or six time return in computing power. But when you start to have uh, 50 machines or 100 machines, things start to really uh, go not so well. Either you platoon somewhere without uh, harvesting any additional power, or sometimes even worse, you'll go back to zero because uh, the machine will be scrambling, communicating each other, and uh, just to reach consistency uh, without making any progress, right? So this is basically one of the you know uh, problem we run into when implementing larger scale machine learning programs. And I argue that uh, there is a need you know, really for new ML systems. And today's system is uh, really uh, not really uh, meeting 
uh, the need uh, posed by what I call the AI and the machine learning programs. And typically, you see very high you know, capex and opex you know, in running those systems. Usually, you, you know, for example, you probably all know this uh, Google Disbelief system, you know, also known as Google Brain. And I remember the first paper was uh, really uh, you know, talking about uh, making possible to drive a, hundred, a thousand machines, running a huge model of maybe a billion parameters, and uh, you know, train you know, on some large data. But if you really do some calculation on the back of your envelope, you probably will realize that a billion parameter is not that big. It's not like you need to have a thousand machines to store that model. It probably takes 10 machines to store that. Why we need so many models on machines? Well, it's because once you split, you lose a consistent view of the whole model. Therefore, you need to maintain you know, correctness, basically, during training. Therefore, multiple copies has to be reproduced to put on different places, and then communication has to happen to you know, negotiate a consist or achieve a consistency. And there are many other things that has to be happening. Therefore, you really need to put a lot of machine into hire a lot of people to run such a system like this. And the typically what you see at best is that uh, this uh, southern machine may return you 100x as good as one machine. Right? So that's kind of uh, what I call to be a, you know, really a uh, cost kind of gap you know, in uh, your input and output. And why this happens? Well, I guess I'm trying to uh, make some observations of uh, what I see you know, in ML community and uh, in the sys community toward large-scale problems. And here is what I observed. From a machine learning researcher's point of view, including myself, I guess when we develop algorithms and when we want to make it faster, usually we work on a lot of mathematical tricks. We want to show something with better convergence rate, meaning that it takes fewer number of iterations to converge. right? And uh, the measurement could be you know, 1 over t, now 1 over t square, or 1 over epsilon, or 1 over square root of epsilon, or something like that. And uh, therefore, this particular step is the key. I need to really make the right you know, implementation, uh, right derivation of uh, this update step, which uh, will happen iteratively. But uh, we usually don't worry about uh, on what system and, uh, it should happen, and also whether the system guarantees what it wants to, uh, what is supposed to happen. Therefore. You know, very often we are going to see you know uh, the program uh, being deployed on a system that is uh, not ideal. For example, not all the machines are running at the same pace, uh, due to various reasons. I'm going to uh, not not going to talk about. But typically, people will see the following kind of breakdown of the <laughs> of the resource. You are going to spend maybe 10% of your time on the computing and maybe 80% or 90% of the time in communication. That's a typical curve we actually see in our system, you know, even a modest distributed system. Right. So this is, of course, you know, not ideal. You know, basically, even a good algorithm you know, may not uh, you know, deliver you the expected return just due to system cost. On the other side, the system people also try to ramp up with their implementation. And uh, what they view as a good implementation is to have a very, very good throughput meaning that uh, in every iteration, I'm going to process the data with crazy rate, you know, faster you know, than you know, uh, your implementation. For example, I can put 10 machines instead of one machine to process data, and therefore I get uh, 10 times throughput. But uh, whether these throughput are correctly you know, uh, contributing to the update of uh, the, the learning, that's you know, usually taken for granted you know, in, in, in fact by, by system people. Usually they think you know, the algorithm will just work. It's like black, black box. As long as I push data in, it should uh, behave the way it should behave. Uh, but uh, uh, that's not necessarily true. In fact, uh, if you don't, you're not careful about uh, correctness and consistency and that kind of thing, you know, even though you process a lot of data in every iteration, you know, the actual return may be suboptimal. Therefore, you end up needing more iterations to converge. So that kind of uh, you know, benefit you get through high throughput was actually, in the end, amortized or you know, diminishing due to more number of iterations. And also, there are other issues about uh, harvesting special properties in machine learning programs, such as you know, dependency structures among parameters and uh, you know, dynamically changing convergence rate among different parameters and so on and so forth. And these actually are very, very uh, foreign, basically, to the system engineers. Therefore, they were often left untouched. And also, there are assumptions by you know, some of the recent development uh, on better representations and pro interface about uh, being able to 
shoehole you know, a uh, arbitrary machining program into a predefined format, such as you know, a, star, uh, a Spark RDD data structure or a, uh, a graph lab vertex program structure. Uh, these are actually all very good ideas, but uh, it requires you to have substantial skill to turn, say, a neural network or a uh, LDA model into that format to make possible you know, efficient programming. All these are quite non-trivial. Therefore, you don't see actually a lot of implementations like that you know, in the community. So for various reasons, you may get a high throughput program, but they may run into trouble in convergence. They may converge very much slowly, or they may just diverge. That's basically, you know, uh, what we see from the other side of the bridge. So then what happens is that uh, in order to you know, make happen a specific uh, implementation, I need to really build a strong team, like you know, maybe focusing on deep learning and then study a specific uh, hardware infrastructure and do this vertical. And that's basically what we see right now in major companies. Uh, you see in Google, in Microsoft, you know, you, these uh, powerful teams building specialized, highly, highly, highly sophisticated verticals for specific needs. And for big companies, which has a lot of business, you see this jungle. They say there are many, many different verticals, each one serving a particular thing. Therefore, on a data center, you see programs running totally in isolated way, you know, you know on, on, on their own kind of uh, maybe subclasses, and then causing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you know, maintenance cost, or maybe a waste of resource, and so on and so forth. So in my opinion, this is not the ideal way to you know, you know, make use of uh, the system. What I would like to see uh, is uh, a view like this. You want to have uh, you know, a data center operating system which is now uh, you know, departing from the traditional database-oriented service, but moving more toward AI machine learning type of uh, applications and such that they are also easily programmable so that you don't need to worry about many of the you know, system details. And then there are also you know, libraries of workhorse algorithms you know, running on top of uh, such an operating system to serve a variety of different applications. So that's kind of the view, uh, in my opinion, could be very attractive if it's possible. So that's basically you know, something that we are trying to uh, push for. So how to make this happen? I guess uh, inevitably, you know, whenever I, you know, the, the fact that I keep emphasizing there is a need, especially addressing machine learning applications, you know, you have to understand what is machine learning applications. They are different from many of the older classical applications we see in computer workload, such as uh, scientific computing, uh, simulation, or maybe uh, you know, database like an Oracle system. Well, I think one of the you know, trademark, you know, you know, hallmark you know, in machine learning is that it is not a set of operations. It is really a mathematical program which may be taking a form like this. Right? Usually we want to introduce a model. The model is defined on data and the model is also characterized by some parameters. And then your goal is to find the best configuration of the parameters so that you know, the model, uh, the, um, some functions, some loss functions, or some quality measurement functions, you know, based on model on the data can be optimized. Therefore, you are really solving a optimization program, you know, to get the argmax of theta. And also, one other hallmark of uh, this problem is that uh, such problem usually does not yield a closed form solution. You know, you cannot simply derive an <coughs> analytical form where you can do, you know, the solution in a single step. Typically, it is a fixed point equation. Therefore, one need to run an iterative convergent program like this, in which you know, in every step, you're going to compute an uh, you know, a increment or some update based on the model, and uh, by taking the derivative maybe, or some other you know, uh, extensions of that. And uh, they are going to do this repetitively many times until it is converging. And uh, well, that equation, help me at least to expose you know, where you know, the difficulty due to large data and the large model you know, can be you know, uh, now grasped and then therefore taken care of hopefully. For example, in the presence of a big data, you see this particular update function now look like this. Right? So this data becomes so big and then you need to now compute the parameters you know, on top of this and uh, this one may go outside, you know, go beyond the capacity of a single machine. Therefore, you have to distribute the D. And uh, if you have a large data, a large model, like a deep neural network of many layers and many hidden nodes, 
then you know you may have uh, you know a huge theta, right? And uh, that can be also beyond the capacity of a machine. Therefore, you have to distribute that. And the data, well, it could be also big, but uh, you know, for the sake of a simple argument, I not worry about one aspect at a time. And then, of course, there are this uh, f function, which uh, uh, correspond to different types of uh, machine learning models. And uh, typically, I guess, even though we now, you know, from NIPS and ICML each year, we see hundreds of new models being proposed. I guess they largely fall into two bigger families. One is you know, some kind of optimization program, which are more taking the flavor of a frequentist kind of uh, approach to problems. They are having you know, deterministic objective function, and then they are going to use some kind of uh, gradient style approach to solve it. And here, I think I have an example in the form of a linear regression, for example. And uh, here, you can see clearly where this bigness you know, is manifested, right? So uh, the model matrix, uh, this is the data, and this is the model. And uh, when we say big, it means that uh, this uh, regression coefficient vector could be a billion dimension, for example. Well, a billion dimension may be able to fit into you know, one machine if you buy a special purpose machine. But remember that once your vector is inside a machine, then the process of that vector has to be sequential. Therefore, you have to wait you know, one after another parameters to be updated. And therefore, simply uh, the size of the problem is not the only argument for parallelization. In fact, if you want to have a speed and you want to make use of multi machine, you still have an incentive to distribute it. And the, the other type of machine program is probably a probabilistic model. You know, I think uh, one of the most uh, popular model is the topic model. And uh, here you are going to maybe uh, run a give sampling algorithm, which uh, make use of a proposal distribution that is uh, every time re-estimated from some very large volume sufficient statistic, such as the, you know, the, 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 the word doc count or the word, document, uh, the, the, the word topic counts and so on. Right? And they can be also very big. And uh, again, back to our you know, machine learning you know, specialty, you know, we invent a lot of uh, optimization algorithms and the MCMC algorithms to accelerate those. And here, I think these you know, uh, lines covered, at least for me, the, 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 a good part of my career for the past 10 years. We, we, we worked on many of these uh, fancy algorithms. And our goal is to really you know, make it you know, make the convergence rate maybe from uh, 1 over t square to 1 over t, 1 over t square, uh, uh, one, from 1 over t square root of t to 1 over t and 1 over t square. Or maybe reversely, I can, I can say, measure the speed in terms of uh, epsilon and so on. So that's basically the holy grail of machine research. You really want to push for faster convergence rate. Here, the rate is a little bit harder to analyze, but still, you know, you can imagine a collapsed version of Gibbs sampling, therefore you reduce the number of parameters to be sampled, and uh, you do uh, reverse jump MCMC so that uh, you can you know, move beyond different mortalities and all that. So these are all very familiar terms for machine learning people. And if you talk this to the system people, they probably will turn away from you because uh, this is a little bit too heavy for them. And you really want to, you know, don't expect them to really come up with a, a better thing you know, then you can come up with. So this is indeed, you know, uh, our very strengths. But the problem is that it is enough or not. I guess most of our implementation, including myself, happened in my lab. And sometimes it's implementing C and then on a single machine. We worry, you know, very little about uh, the system details. Maybe the most we worry about when it actually go to a parallel system is the very correctness of the algorithm. For example, is a parallel version uh, equivalent to a sequential program? so that I can you know, guarantee correctness of the results. Right? And uh, notice that one of the key ingredients to guarantee correctness is uh, the ability to uh, properly synchronize different machines. That's also the simplest way to make sure correctness. And uh, uh, then we, we are happy to assume that the uh, you know, machine has to be synced. And then under synchronization, we can prove all these nice properties you know, of convergence. And there are many, many papers you know, showing that. But the problem is that uh, is there any, you know, do, do you really see a totally, you know, and cheaply synchronized system or not? That's actually not a trivial thing because uh, in a real computer cluster, especially at a data center scale, everything can happen, right? 
uh, first of all, you no longer own the single system. There are many other users who are on the same system. You cannot say that, oh, tomorrow is my deadline, therefore please log off and I'm going to do my experiment and so on and so forth. So all these curves that you see on the paper is not realizable in fact you know, in, in, in the industrial environment. And then there are temperature change, there are machine faulty behavior and all that kind of thing. Therefore, you will almost always run into the problem of uh, one or multiple of the machine in a cluster is not behaving the way you want it to behave. So now the question is that, do you wait for it? Do you repeat the process? Or do you move forward and, uh, you know, and uh, you know, ignore you know, such kind of behavior? So that's basically the topic of today. You know, most people would view this as a, a problem beyond machine learning. It is really into the system. But I would argue that uh, you know, having a good machine learning insight would really you know, uh, uh, make it possible to uh, regain you know, you know, the potential of uh, you know, further speed up or enlarge machine learning programs. So let, let me begin with a contrast of uh, the differences of uh, ML program versus a classical program. I kind of view ML program to be the act of, uh, to be doing the, you know, the, the act of uh, climbing a mountain. So it's really about uh, solving this uh, optimization problem using iteration. So it is optimization centric and iterative convergent. Your goal is to get to the top mountain, uh, but your goal is not about repeating a particular step that is designed by someone. You know, that's one way to reach to the mountain, but if you discovered a way you know, along your way to get there quicker, you know, that's also fine, right? But uh, a classical program is actually quite operation-centric. Your very goal is to execute the steps that I prescribed, especially in database. You are not supposed to deviate from the, the, the procedure that I wrote. Therefore, if you had a mistake, you have to redo it. That's like uh, making this a uh, big kind of Lego or jigsaw puzzle. If you made a mistake, you know, your whole thing will collapse. Therefore, you have to, you know, redo it, right? And I have this specific example in sorting, for example, which is uh, you know, a typical database operation. And uh, if you do distributed sorting, if uh, anywhere there is a mistake, then if you don't correct it, it will propagate and eventually collapse the whole program. Right? Therefore, you know, you know, error tolerance in database or in classical computing is one of the holy grails. You have to deal with it very, very efficiently and correctly. But again, in machine learning, I don't think that's uh, always true. You know, suppose that uh, this, this, folk is, uh, is, this fellow is a little bit drunken, for example. You know, he's not able to control exactly his step, but he's not totally drunk so that he probably still can recognize the top of the hill. And uh, uh, he knows that he is actually moving forward or moving backward, that kind of level of cognition. And uh, then, you know, if he happens to make a wrong step somewhere, usually you typically don't see he would walk back and redo the step. He probably would just stay there and make some observation and make the next step accordingly, right? So there is this uh, ability to self-adjust, uh, which is uh, very, very typical for machine algorithm. You know, taking stochastic gradient algorithm, for example, you know, by definition, your gradient is already not correct because you are taking stochastic samples. But still, you, know, you can prove that it is converging at the end of the day, right? So this property is actually very, very typical for machine learning algorithms. And there are a few others. For example, there are these uh, dynamic structure dependencies in the sense that uh, the parameters you know, are coupled to each other. And uh, some are strongly coupled, and some are loosely or, or not coupled. And uh, that actually offers also opportunities for you to do better division you know, of the problem if uh, you know the structure. And also, uh, there is this uh, empirical observation that uh, the convergence behavior of a high dimensional problem is also quite interesting, right? If, for example, if you measure the convergence of a topic model, I think people reported that 95% uh, of the parameters will converge in the first five iterations, and then the remaining a thousand iteration will be working for the other 5% of the parameters. So if you have a program which uh, treat all the parameters uh, indifferently, uh, that's obviously a waste. Okay? I can list actually a longer kind of a collection of uh, such properties, but uh, my argument is that it's really you know, a huge opportunity presented to us that you know, by focusing on optimization-centric and iterative conversion program in machine learning, you really need a system that is uh, moving beyond the older transaction-centric and atomic correctness-oriented design. And so that's basically giving me uh, the opportunity to argue against kind of this uh, 
you know, view currently we see in many of the big data platform. It's over-engineered and often do something that is not necessarily useful, right? So why don't we just uh, try to make it simple without uh, taking down the quality of the program, right? So I want to begin by maybe, uh, 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 argue, maybe presenting some simple ideas, which is merely about uh, what to parallelize before I drive down into some more technical notion about uh, how that kind of parallelization can be implemented. So this, again, seems to be a no problem for you know, my, uh, my system friends. Well, parallelization of program, you know, you parallelize data, right? And, uh, and uh, the first time I told them about, well, there are these are two phase, you know, the, this dichotomy you know, in data and model. Uh, it's actually hard to you know, send a message because to a computer scientist, you know, classical computer scientist, data and model are just bits inside the memory. There, there, there isn't a difference. Once you distribute it, you just distribute it. But uh, to a machine learning people, we have no problem distinguishing these two phases, right? Because uh, for data, they are the kind of the, uh, the given kind of uh, facts which uh, won't change. And also statistically, you know, once you decide on a model, then you, know, you divide the data into different things. They, uh, at least the one common assumption we make is that they are identically and independently distributed. Therefore, they don't interfere with each other. But for model, it's a different thing. Model is a transient thing because uh, you start from random guess and you converge to something. Therefore, model is always changing over time. And also, model parameters are coupled. They have dependencies. Therefore, when you put them onto different machines, they are not independent of each other, even given the data. Therefore, obviously, there is a need for different mechanisms to communicate. Right. So that's basically my first message about uh, you know, how to you know, maybe uh, uh, do you know, parallel machine learning in a more sophisticated way by you know, observing this dichotomy between model and data. And uh, here, again, I have a few examples to even further illustrate this sophistication. Taking Lasso as an example, Lasso is about uh, estimating you know, basically this uh, regression coefficient given data input and data output. Right? And uh, you know, in terms of a data parallel Lasso, you know, you, you know, the, the picture you see is that uh, you can imagine a globally shared model, maybe using a distributed shared memory architect, and then that's going to be visible on every worker machine. Therefore, every worker will be computing a subgradient based on partial data. And then somehow they need to be aggregated, right? And this looks like a MapReduce program. But uh, if you run into a very, very ultra high dimensional problem where, you know, the model becomes too big, or you just want it to be uh, quicker, then you divide the model into different things. Sorry. I forgot to turn on my phone, sorry about that. And then, you know, the simplest way to do this is to just uh, put the data to be in a common place so that everybody can see it. And uh, you can already see this actually is uh, already pushing for a different system architect to realize that. And the same thing for topic model. You know, you can imagine the topic to be shared and the data to be distributed. Or in some cases, because you have uh, both large data and large model, there is actually a way to simultaneously distribute the model and the data. So how that can happen? Well, if you really, really are into this particular model, you will realize that uh, some documents will have uh, only some keywords that are highly you know, represented. Therefore, they could uh, occupy a particular block you know, in this uh, you know, problem. And uh, then there are some other documents, you know, like, say sports documents. They have a different set of keywords. Therefore, it is safe to put them into a different place so that they touch the word only often seen in sports and so on. So again, that kind of highlighting the needs for even the implementer to you know, know a bit about machine learning. And that often gives you a very high return you know, in making a better program. So now given this kind of uh, maybe uh, uh, you know, slightly deeper view into the program you know, uh, you know, uh, details, the next step, of course, is to make the implementation. Well, implementation is uh, usually quite easy you know, if you write a MATLAB code. But uh, on a distributed system, what makes the whole thing harder is really to uh, make this happen. Right? So in an iterative program, I need to do something in every iteration. And that do something usually requires me to touch all the data points and update all the model parameters. And then if uh, you have a big cluster of model machines, then you need to you know, consider many things. You know, how to divide the data, what's the batch size, how to partition the model, how to synchronize step size. 
And usually this contributes to a few thousand lines of code, which is really, really, you know, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, it really turns people off. In, in fact, you know, in many of the machine learning community, and uh, usually uh, that's where we declare a boundary, say, hey, I'm done, and I did my math, and uh, I put my theorem already. Now you're going to 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 make this part happen, right? And uh, well, indeed, you know, people will take it away and make it happen. But uh, whether it is a good way or bad way, you know, that's something I would like to discuss a little bit. It turns out that there are many different ways to address all these different issues. To the point that if you know, again, you know, if you are willing to bring machine learning principles into you know, any of these issues, for example, how to distribute, how to bridge communications, and how to communicate, and uh, what to communicate, it actually also, again, offer a huge opportunity to further you know, improve the scalability uh, of uh, the machine learning program. So I'm going to uh, maybe spend the rest half an hour talking a little bit about uh, the principles, you know, that uh, we discovered to be very useful and interesting, you know, in each of these dimensions, okay, which again, in my opinion, has been somewhat neglected, you know, in our machine learning community. You know, we really don't talk about, for example, communication models between machines, right? We just say, okay, MapReduce is taking care of that already. I need to just uh, write a uh, map code and reduce code and don't worry about why it's, uh, how it happens. Which is, you know, really, you know, a nice abstraction that uh, should be achieved also by maybe uh, uh, additional mechanisms. But unfortunately, right now, uh, there's either map reduce or you go to MPI to manage the communication by yourself, which again is very difficult. So let me uh, go to uh, the distribution first. How to distribute? Well, that's probably the closest problem to the core of machine learning because. Uh, uh, distribution is really about uh, disentangling, you know, you know, uh, variables or entities inside a ML program uh, that uh, without breaking the correctness of the program. For example, taking this uh, regression problem as uh, an example, you know, the goal is to estimate this beta, and suppose beta becomes very big, and uh, then I'm going to divide them into different machines, right? And the one of the approach is known as the shotgun algorithm. You just randomly distribute. Right? And uh, there are also analysis about when it is converging and so on. But uh, every people know that it is not actually that trivial because uh, you can easily show to yourself that uh, for every pair of parameters in a lasso or in a linear regression, there are these uh, dependencies which can be quantified, in, in fact, by the correlation between the corresponding two dimensions in the data points. And uh, if, you, if it happened that uh, you didn't pay attention to this, and uh, you somehow uh, put this uh, beta one and a beta two, which is uh, highly coupled into two machines. How highly they can couple? Maybe that collinear. Maybe beta two is just twice of beta one for some reason. Then, you know, if uh, two machines fail to communicate, then there is no way to guarantee that uh, the other one is uh, twice the size of the first one. Right. So, you know, uh, we actually uh, look into this problem, and. Uh, found that uh, there is opportunity to really avoid dependency errors you know, where you know, using a structure-aware parallelization. You know, kind of you use a microscope to look into those uh, programs. And uh, of course, there could be a nice program interface for you to make that easy. And then you can basically do this uh, structure-aware scheduling and also you know, do it in a, in a cost-effective way. So again, this is uh, a quite expensive problem because uh, if you have a high-dimensional problem, then scheduling the priority of different parameters is as hard as uh, the problem itself, if not harder, because the problem is already very big. And uh, that's actually one of the problems run into by problems like uh, programs like GraphLab. You build a graph, and you want to study dependencies. If the graph is too big, then solving that graph partitioning problem itself is also very expensive. Therefore, you, know, you somehow need to work in the balance between being able to solve it, things correctly and solve things efficiently. So here we have a number of tricks. You know, such as using the priority scheduling. Remember that uh, I mentioned only a few parameters are actually important and slowly converging, and most of them are actually you know, not that important. Therefore, you can probably just uh, every time sample those important ones. And how to sample the important ones? Well, you can simply using heuristic, say, uh, uh, get those ones which get the biggest update from the last iteration, showing that they are still under very, very rapid convergence, uh, rapid updates. 
And for those one which has a small delta, meaning that they are probably already converging, then I should neglect that. So these kind of procedures can be provided by a user basically to you know, augment you know, the efficiency of uh, scheduling. And there are also more formal kind of block scheduling program to you know, disentangle you know, convert, uh, uh, dependencies in a more formal way. Uh, without going through detail, here is a result of uh, contrasting you know, a structure aware scheduling versus uh, a, uh, a random scheduling or no scheduling. And you can see this uh, very sharp improvement of the convergence rate you know, uh, uh, across a variety of different programs, such as you know, matrix factorization, LDA, and of course, Lasso. Not only you, know, you can have empirical <laughs> speed up, you can actually also you know, establish uh, a, you know, a formal analysis of uh, the correctness of this procedure. Again, without going through detail, we were able to prove that the rate of convergences you know, uh, is actually quite you know, uh, uh, optimum if uh, you, you know, have a good way to uh, do the right scheduling. So typically, you know, when we want to show a parallel convergence, I don't think it's enough to just show that uh, the program converged with one over t. Now, that's usually what machine learning people worry about. It's the correctness of the algorithm. But the fact that you use p machines should uh, explicitly give you some return. Therefore, we would like to see a p in the, in the denominator. Right? But is that possible? Well, in fact, it's not always true. Because uh, in reality, you know, if you do the analysis, you will see that the p is also compromised by this term, okay? which uh, is uh, related to the dimensionality of a problem, the, the spectrum radians of the data, and so on and so forth. So what a parallel program is doing is actually to somehow kill this term so that this whole thing returns to 1 over p. And how to do that? For example, you can explicitly <coughs> minimize the row, which is the spectrum diameters of uh, the sub data set across different uh, points. So quick yeah. question. So this strategy mm -hmm. uh, imposes an overload of the combinatorial scale, mm -hmm. correct? It is, yeah. If you do it exhaustively over the whole problem, it is, of course, imposing a uh, additional overload. So, but then you're, you're facing with this task of figuring out these substructures of your data, mm -hmm. where things are independent or roughly independent. Yeah. And that by itself is a very expensive. That's true. Search that might not be parallelizable. Is it the case? Or? Uh, that is true. But uh, remember that uh, the, here the heuristic kicks in, right? You can, for example, you know, uh, pre-record the, you know, uh, analyze the data once, or you can basically subsample only the important dimensions of, of the data. Of, of, the, of the model and do this a heuristic partition, right? So yeah, so indeed, you know, you need to pay a cost, but it is a one-time cost. You don't have to pay in every iteration, right? And uh, so, you know, that's basically, you know, a, uh, uh, at least a, a theoretical guarantee that uh, doing this correctly will actually get you a better convergence. So for the interest of time, I'm going to skip some of the detailed ideas you know, in uh, this kind of scheduling. You know, for example, you can do structure-aware parallelization of LDA based on the blockage of uh, you know, document and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and a word coupling. So that uh, every time I'm going to parallelize you know, non-overlapping sub-blocks you know, over different machines. This paper was, uh, this idea was uh, first presented by Gamula's paper a few years ago. And then you can actually get it more elaborated by coupling it with uh, other synchronization procedures that I'm going to talk about in a second. But uh, I want to drive back to uh, these particular uh, experimental results that I feel will be very interesting. Typically, you know, when you see uh, you know, a, uh, a system-ish kind of uh, a report of a parallel machine learning program, yeah, what you see actually is not quite you know, the, 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 the full picture. You, know, you will see actually a report of uh, faster uh, you know, uh, throughput, you know, uh, so that uh, they, they give you a sense, uh, a feeling of uh, being very, very rapid, you know, compared to a conventional implementation. But um, the actual, uh, you know, uh, progress you make, you know, for a machine program is actually not only about throughput, as I mentioned earlier. It actually, you know, is the combination of uh, the per iteration throughput times the number of iterations you have to use to converge. Therefore, you know, we actually show that uh, when you parallelize you know, across multiple machines, you are not supposed to compromise the quality of uh, every iteration you know, you know, resulted from a distributed implementation, in the sense that uh, you shouldn't uh, increase the number of iterations to converge. Right? So here you can see that uh, in our SAP you know, distributed program, 
when increasing the number of machines from 25 to 100, the total number of iterations is virtually unchanged. And then plus that you are now pushing through better uh, throughput by having more machines, your end outcome is uh, you know, a uh, strong increase of uh, the solution speed. I wouldn't say convergence rate now. It's a solution speed of uh, the whole problem. But on the other hand, if uh, you look at some of the earlier updates, uh, res results, for example, from the Yahoo LDA or from some other large screen implementations. Typically, what is reported is this uh, very nice kind of uh, speed up, you know, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in throughput. But uh, if you run the experiment a little bit more carefully, you will also show, see that uh, with uh, more and more machines, the number of iterations it takes to converge actually becomes one more. Why? Because uh, if you do a sloppy job in synchronization or maybe no synchronization across machines, then the quality of the updates you get from different machines will be rather poor. And when you combine them, it will be even worse. And then you need more iterations. It's like this drunken guy is always making wrong steps. Then you have to take longer steps to get to the top. Right? Therefore, if you multiply these two together, you actually get a very, very poor you know, speed up you know, versus uh, you know, a single machine implementation. Right. So that's kind of an experiment I would like to show, which is usually not even realized in the system community. Okay, now I talked about uh, uh, you know, how, what to, uh, how to uh, partition. Then I want to spend a few minutes on how to bridge the communication. Uh, so bridging model is a big deal, in fact, in a system, because uh, it is uh, you know, the core mechanism governing how machine coordinate you know, from each other. And one of the best known you know, communication or bridging model is known as the, the, the BSP model, the bulk synchronous parallel model, right? you know, proposed by, uh, by Valent and Macon uh, almost uh, two decades ago. It's now the cornerstone of uh, uh, most of the parallel systems, for example, you see in Hadoop and Spark. Right? The idea is that to set a synchronous barrier you know, after you know, every you know, iteration, therefore all the threads will meet at this barrier and uh, you know, maybe uh, wait until everybody come and uh, do aggregation and then do next step. So no computing you know, during the barrier and no communication you know, during computing. That's kind of the, thing, the idea, which is uh, very elegant. It actually ensures that the program is correct. But um, in reality, this is a pretty expensive procedure because all these uh, white spaces okay, is uh, left uh, you know, uh, unused basically you know, for waiting. And uh, in very often cases, this white space can be rather severe. For example, you know, this is uh, you know, a, a real number we measured on our system you know, by running a LDA model. In fact, by running only the LDA model, no other programs on this system, you'll still see this uh, huge you know, communication waiting time. So you know, we ask, is there a way to somehow uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, make things more efficient? Of course, the most efficient thing you can make is to uh, just remove the barrier and no wait at all, right? Run, let every program just run at their own pace and they meet at the end of the day, maybe. Or maybe they just uh, communicate at any time they want to. Uh, this is definitely very, very fast because there is no waiting time. But uh, it will seriously compromise the correctness because uh, you know, the iteration five and the iteration three here may not be compatible, right? So one of the ideas that we tried is uh, to introduce uh, the so-called uh, partial insynchronization, uh, such as in this picture. We basically allow every worker to be different you know, from other workers in a bounded number of iterations, so that uh, you know, it is uh, not too inconsistent from others. And uh, then you know, during this, uh, you know, this uh, window, every machine can run at their own pace and uh, run many iterations as they could. Right? Uh, so this is called uh, the uh, the still synchronous parallel model. Of course, uh, there are a lot of details in how to implement this. The first idea came a couple of years ago where the stillness is measured by the absolute uh, magnitude of the updates achieved at each different worker. Therefore, I'm going to com compare the magnitude. Uh, when it is uh, not reaching a bound, I'm going to allow machine to run. But it turns out that this is uh, you know, a very difficult communication uh, procedure because uh, we need to basically now communicate the update you know, across machines, which is just like uh, the full communication. Then later, we are reducing them to counting the iteration number. Therefore, every machine needs to just send one bit of their iteration counts. Right? You can also you know, use uh, other things like a clock time and stuff like that. 
but uh, the idea is really to control the drift between different machines in the ways they bound. And it turns out that this substantially increase the speed of, uh, of uh, uh, through, uh, the throughput. And also, it uh, allows one to analyze the program's behavior to show whether it is correct or not. We were actually able to show two theorems, uh, which uh, uh, actually uh, uh, guarantees that both data parallel and model parallel implementations using the SSC model can be proven to be convergent and correct. So here are some mathematics telling people how exactly that can be implemented. I think it's kind of uh, intuitive already that the data parallel means that uh, in this uh, computing of uh, the grading the step, I'm going to distribute them across different machines. Uh, and then you know, the projection, for example, happens on the server. But the projection can tolerate some you know, asynchronism across different machines. And uh, empirically, you see an improvement you know, over you know, uh, the, the, the Docker synchronous version. And theoretically, we actually can show that uh, the quality of the convergence is actually well controlled by the total, the average drift between different machines, and also by the variance of the drifts across different machines. On the other side, the model parallel thing is a little bit trickier to implement because uh, your aggregation is now not a summation of uh, different uh, sub-updates from different uh, machines, but uh, a concatenation of uh, different uh, partial kind of uh, gradings from uh, different uh, uh, clients. Uh, but still, you know, we were able to show that empirically there is a, a, a very uh, good uh, speed up, and uh, theoretically, you can also show a convergence, you know, correctness guarantee. So the key idea here is that uh, you want to bound the delay between different machines. And of course, you know, these, uh, uh, once people get this idea, you can put this idea into the very implementation of yourself by controlling every machine explicitly, if you will. But uh, uh, what we did, of course, is to provide a program interface like MapReduce so that uh, these are taken care of automatically. So that you, what you see are only a, almost like a MapReduce abstraction so that you can dispatch jobs to different machines. So that's the second idea about uh, building a little bit fancier communication bridging models. The third idea is about uh, how to communicate. Well, this is, again, you know, a very engineering idea, but uh, it turns out that you know, it still has room to improve. For example, you know, even in SSP, you know, there is still this uh, phase transition where you do computing and you do communication. It's just that uh, the computing you know, does not have to wait for each other. But uh, a more aggressive idea is to do this so-called managed communication because every time you are computing a huge parameter, you don't have to wait until everything is computed before you dispatch that. You can really streaming the patch solution out, especially in a deep neural network imaging. You have multiple layers. If you are done with the top layers and you are working on the lower layers, it's fine to send the top layers out for the other kind of uh, machine to make use of that. Right? So this overlaying between the communication and computing indeed gives you a lot of leverage. And uh, we were able to show empirically that uh, in a number of different programs, such as a matrix factorization uh, in LDA, you see, again, a dramatic drop of the total speed, uh, total uh, 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 increase of the total efficiency. In here, you can see that uh, with SSP, which is already efficient, you, know, you have a bar like this. But uh, now with uh, you know, a, uh, you know, a managed communication, you can cut it again you know, by you know, almost like a, you know, a quarter, uh, you know, a four-fold cut. And then you can further reduce it by doing some uh, prioritization you know, in, the, in the communication. So that's basically becoming closer to the engineering part. But uh, I want to argue that you know, you know, this can you know, give you additional benefit if you are willing to you know, put some machine learning ideas into you know, the prioritization and also into the very design of uh, this communication management. One other thing, the last thing is about uh, uh, people usually don't talk about, uh, thought about, think about this, this uh, topology of communication. I think machine learning people are very used to this uh, master slave picture because it's such a nice abstraction that uh, I have the problem the server count and the abstract where server, you know, you know, there's this uh, uh, bipartite kind of uh, uh, phase where uh, models are somewhere and data are somewhere, and then I have uh, this uh, clean implementation. But uh, implementation is clean, whereas the, the, the code is actually uh, more expensive to maintain because you have now the server code and the client code, and they need to be separately maintained, and so on and so forth. And also, there is this unique bottleneck here, which uh, sometimes could uh, cause some uh, system risk. 
Well, the, of course, the benefit of course is that the communication volume is rather low because uh, it's a you know a single point kind of a communication uh, process. But you know, indeed, you know, in the system community, uh, there are frequent use of the peer-to-peer -peer idea where you know you just have uh, you know symmetric implementations on every machine, a single client code. Everybody just uh, communicate with everybody else, you know, for you know some computing task. Usually, machine people don't like it because uh, this is a kind of a, a p square kind of a communication cost. Therefore, you may risk congesting the whole kind of uh, uh, you know network. But again, you know, an idea that does not work for traditional computing may work in in machine learning because machine learning had this a great deal of error tolerance, so that you may need to only communicate with uh, a few nearest neighbors and uh, just wish for this uh, iterative magic to allow the message to pass into you know, further neighbors during its iteration. So there actually were theories, such as the Houghton sequence theory, you know, proving that uh, you can still reach convergence by just communicating with uh, a few neighbors. So again, that's an another you know, space where machine learning can be exploited to make a better system implementation. So last but not least, I want to say a few word, more words about uh, what to communicate. This is again an idea that is very strange. It's not my idea. In fact, one of my students proposed to me, and at the first I thought it's, uh, it's too strange. I wasn't able to appreciate it, but uh, it turns out to be a, a rather interesting idea. So the idea concerns about uh, this so-called uh, matrix parameterized model. Well, many models are matrix parameterized, right? In, in a topic model, for example. You know, it's basically a matrix of a word, doc, a topic, uh, frequency counts. And, uh, and uh, in you know, multitask logistic regression, for example, sparse coding, it's basically you learn a dictionary, for example. And uh, again, in the high dimensional problem and the multi-dimensional task problem, these matrices can be very big. And uh, you can imagine communication, this whole thing, or a gradient of this you know, across either a master slave or a peer-to-peer -to -peer topology can be very, very daunting. Right? It turns out that uh, these are full updates which appear to be you know, a, also a matrix may have some low rank properties, okay, which uh, was usually underappreciated. For example, you can show that uh, in many cases, you know, in, uh, under a stochastic gradient program, these uh, updates is not only low, low rank, it is actually rank one. Okay, it actually can be represented by the outer product between two update vectors. Okay, actually that's a very, very interesting behavior. And uh, which uh, is not obvious, but uh, once you notice that uh, delta W can be actually produced by an outer product of uh, U and, uh, and the mu, you may suddenly realize that uh, why don't we just communicate these vectors, call them pre-updates, and then let the outer product happen you know, in the target, not, not on the source. Right? So that's basically another idea. We call them a sufficient factor broadcasting. You, know, you can basically broadcast this, uh, I, these uh, updates you know, to different clients, uh, different workers, and then gets uh, you know, a, a very low cost kind of uh, synchronization across machines. Of course, uh, because of this uh, SV, S, uh, you know, sufficient factor uh, kind of uh, definition, the communication topology has to be peer to peer. Basically, every, you know, every client needs to have the same picture of the model. You cannot just wait for the you know, the, uh, the server to broadcast a matrix. You just need, uh, you know, basically the instantaneous picture of uh, the model updates at every step. Therefore, the best way is to just broadcast the vector by themselves. But again, combined with the Houghton sequence idea and so on, you can really broadcast these messages at very low cost to neighbors, still uh, achieving a, a good consistency uh, result. So in fact, we were able to prove that uh, this idea indeed leads to the same kind of uh, answer as uh, you broadcast the full solution to the workers. Here are some empirical results. Uh, you know, comparing to Spark, which is uh, not only broadcasting the full thing, but also do it in a BSP fashion, uh, obviously it is going to be very, very slow. But even with uh, a, a full matrix kind of a parameter server type of topology, you can see you know, a cost like this. But uh, with a sufficient factor broadcasting kind of procedure, you see a huge reduction of uh, the runtime you know, in uh, a number of different applications like uh, multilinear regression, sparse coding, 
you know, uh, distance metric learning and so on. And here I have another curve showing you the breakdown, right? You can see that, uh, you know, uh, what is really reduced is actually the network waiting time, right? So here, you know, the solid blue bar are the network waiting time of uh, this uh, full matrix broadcast, which was reduced now to this uh, tiny fraction, you know, in the you know, SFB uh, problem, uh, idea. And the computing time is roughly comparable across different machines, across different, uh, you know, uh, level of stillness and across different type of tasks. So that's basically all the ideas I would like to share uh, you know, in our journey to uh, maybe a, a more efficient system uh, infrastructure for machine learning. I talked about uh, how to distribute, how to bridge, how to communicate, and what to communicate. So at the end of the day, you know, here is the kind of the, 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 the closing remarks I want to uh, wrap up with. Uh, in a sense, I see an opportunity to really develop a distributed machine learning framework specialized for machine learning computation. And uh, it is a system such that it can really make use of the, the nice properties, opportunities in machine program to do you know, flexible, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, error tolerant kind of implementation of uh, programs, uh, which uh, does not need the traditional database style precision. And also it allows you to dynamically do resource reclamation, redistribution, and uh, scheduling and also to deploy you know, these uh, workhorse engine-like solutions, which uh, can be applied to a variety of uh, different problems. For example, ADMM has been now one of the kind of canonical solutions to many operation problems. Then once you know how to implement ADMM very well, or maybe a proximal gradient well, you pretty much you know, are taking care of most of the optimization programs people now propose every day for their specific applications. Right. So we are really trying to reach a little bit deeper, a lower into the solution space, which actually makes life a little bit easier, in fact, by you know, uh, then worrying about uh, every special instances at a higher level. So I just want to say maybe one word about uh, uh, some of the work we did in the this direction. Uh, some of you probably know that uh, over the past few years, we've been working on this open source platform called Petum Project, which is exactly kind of uh, uh, trying to push out some of the kind of ideas I just mentioned about, such as uh, a, you know, uh, you know, a engine for data parallel operation, which is kind of like a parameter server platform. And then we have also the model parallel API for you know, uh, model scheduling. And then there are libraries on top of it, and there are data storage and transform systems to uh, make more lightweight manipulation of data instead of each time reading the whole thing from the big database on and on, which is rather inefficient. And uh, this is uh, you know, a, a open source project, so it's available for everybody to download and manipulate and to, to work with. And typically we do a half year release cycle. And now I think we are on the, maybe the sixth version of the release. And, uh, and uh, it's becoming quite comprehensive in terms of both the system architect and also the, the library composition. And uh, we see a pretty good kind of uh, evidence of uh, substantial speed up. Right, so here I just have an example of uh, implementing the same topic model you know, on you know, these number of machines over the Spark platform or a specialized Yahoo LDA and our version. You can see orders of magnitude speed up in speed and also orders of magnitude you know, achievability you know, in terms of the model size. Like the light LDA model we uh, published last year was I think one of the biggest, if not the biggest topic model or machine learning model ever reported. It has a trillion parameters. Okay, it basically uh, one million topic and the one million token per topic. Why it is useful? That's a different story. <laughs> okay, you know, I mean, some people. I mean, in fact, uh, what motivated us to do this is because of the peacock model, which was the one order magnitude smaller than us. It's about a hundred thousand topics. They say this model help help the company to capture the long tail. You know, pattern you know, in topics and make a better you know, uh, user recommendation. So of course, that is beyond really our uh, uh, goal. But uh, just for the pure engineering kind of fun, uh, we decided to do a model 10 times bigger, and we were able to do that. But uh, the point here is that we made it happen on 24 machines instead of uh, you know, in that implementation, which use about 500 or 1,000 machines. So I'm trying to send a message that by really looking into ML mechanisms and the details and the knowing the system, 
you can make things not as daunting as the people would feel you know, in the original place and make some very, very happy and simple implementations with a very good return. So with that, I want to close by thanking uh, many of my students and the collaborators. So Petun now is a very big team with uh, more than a dozen students. Uh, and also we are uh, greatly in depth of uh, our system collaborators, you know, Garth Gibson, Greg Anger, uh, Phil Gibbons and their students uh, were also, uh, are still also, you know, very intimate, you know, parts of our team. And together, you know, we were able to, you know, make uh, the kind of uh, results I just presented. Okay, I think I'm almost in time. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>